Greetings, friends. Joining me today is David Ying, cellist of the Ying Quartet. They'll be playing for our next Carlos Mosley Chamber Series concert uh, Monday, November 21st at 7.30 in Daniel Recital Hall. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, it's my pleasure, Chris. So the first con uh, question that I ask every every uh, everybody I'm talking with in this sort of uh, situation uh, is going to be kind of a funny question for you, and that is, how did your group meet each other? <laughs> well, um, I should probably explain our, the name of our quartet. The Yang Quartet is not named solely after me. I'm not that, I'm not that big of an egomaniac to have done that. Um, and in fact, our first violinist now, his name is Robin Scott. So uh, the fact that three of us are Ying family members, and he is not a Ying family member, makes our name actually a little outdated. But originally, we started off as a quartet of four siblings. And so we tried to think of another name, actually. You know the name we thought of instead of the Ying Quartet, which we wanted to name ourselves? We wanted to name ourselves the Daniel Quartet after our other brother, who is not in the quartet. His name is Daniel. Oh, but okay. There was another Daniel Quartet at the time, ah. and so we couldn't. So then we couldn't think of another name that 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 I don't know. We felt good about, so it turned out to be the Yang Quartet. But now, as I said, we've got Robin Scott in the group since our first violinist brother retired from the group, and so I suppose we've we've sort of humorously tossed around the idea that every fourth year we should be the Scott Quartet. You know, like leap year. What would be Scott Quartet year, but anyhow, he's our, he's for sure our musical brother, if not our actual brother now. Now, those of you who are siblings, when did you first play together as a quartet? How old were you all? You know, there were there were moments in our growing up since well, we realized that we had the correct instruments for a string quartet, but the age range was a little bit big um, when we were younger. And we were lucky enough to grow up in an area where there were um, quite a lot of other kids playing playing music. So I had my own group of high school friends that I would play quartet with, and Janet would play with her people of her age. But on occasion, we would do something together, including with our brother Dan. So we were actually the Ying Quintet sometimes. And probably our first time that we really played together at least in public. Sometimes we would sight read something together at home, you know, over the vacation times or something. But the first time we played in public was we had a standing job at the Northwestern University School of Education. And we grew up in that area of Chicago. And somehow they got a hold of us and we were, because they're in a quarter system, their end of their year was late enough in May or maybe even in June that we were all home even after we, some of us started going to college. So um, that was the one time of year we would play together uh, was for the Northwestern University School of Education ceremony, not the big university, just the School of Education. So I mean, probably our, our signature piece in those days was Pomp and Circumstance. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> starts somewhere. That's so, how we started, yeah. <laughs> so at what point did you start to think, hey, y'all, let's be a professional quartet? And did that cause some friction, some debate? Or was it something where everybody went, yeah, we've been planning on this for years? Yeah, well, our brother Dan, who's a bass player, he got left out. So mm -hmm. I mean, maybe there's friction, but there's no choice about that. He was not going to get to be a part of this. Um, you know, it came together more by chance than by design, Chris. And it, it intersects a little bit with how I first knew you. And that's at the Eastman School of Music, where we now teach. And we were all students in those days. Um, and because of the way our family worked and different ages, people doing different things, everybody oddly congregated at Eastman at the same year. Uh, some Janet was just coming out of high school. She was an undergraduate. Um, she might have even been your class, I think. She was the year behind me, but I okay. remember that you were already there. That I, I believe there. both your brothers were there, and then Janet showed up, and put you there. You were so. You were. So me and my brother Tim were grad students at Eastman at the time. Uh, Phil was actually there only for one year at first because he was taking a leave of absence from a non-music degree. He was an economics major, but missed playing the viola. And so, and he, and for his year off, he wanted to study with Martha Katz, who was on the faculty at Eastman. So since we all sort of congregated at Eastman. And of course, we knew we had the instruments for a string quartet. We decided, we'll try. Let's play together. And um, since the Cleveland Quartet taught at Eastman in those days, they took an interest in us right from the beginning. 
And so it's so I tell people it's a little like the New York Yankees being interested in your little league team. Um, it's kind of like very encouraging when you get that sort of support right from the beginning. Um, so so that's how it started. If we had not all decided to go to Eastman School of Music um, at that one in that one particular year, I don't think we would have a young quartet now. Hmm. And to be sort of to remind folks who might have forgotten, the Cleveland Quartet was one of the great American chamber ensembles of the 20th century. Uh, and they were in residence at Eastman for 20 years or so towards That's the, right. end of the 20th yeah. century, right? Absolutely. And besides being this great quartet, they were also quite uh, dedicated to teaching and bringing along the next generation. So we were so fortunate to sort of fall in their orbit. And that is the position that you have since filled at Eastman, correct? That well, and that feels working. even more fortunate. Okay. Yeah. Already we were attempting to walk in their footsteps, but when we joined the faculty at Eastman in their position, we truly were trying to sort of walk in the footsteps of giants before us. And so um, I feel grateful for everything that, that the Cleveland Quartet members have uh, given, given us as, um, as their students and they as mentors to us. Now, speaking of walking in the footsteps of giants, or perhaps sitting in the cello seats of giants, you were a you know a very very important figure in one of the most interesting musical experiences of my life, one of the best listening experiences of my life, uh, and it was at the Norfolk Festival in the early '90s uh, when you and your siblings had driven down from Tanglewood to see. Yes. A Cleveland quartet. I know what you're talking I was, about. I was, I was a student at, in Norfolk in those days. Uh, and you guys drove down to see your teachers give a quartet and uh, or give a quartet concert. And that's not quite what worked out. So tell tell the folks at home, if you will, David, uh, yeah. what it was that I got to see that day at, uh, at the Norfolk Festival. Well, this was a pretty memorable experience for us, too, and for me in particular. Um, because, yes, we, we drove down from the Tanglewood Festival, which is an hour away. Um, we were homesick for the Cleveland Quartet, as I said, they were so influential on us, on us as teachers. And it was a chance to, having been out, away from Eastman for a couple of years, to come back and hear them again. Uh, we also managed to stop for a big meal of Chinese food along the way, too. So we rolled into Norfolk, already stomachs full, nice, nice seat, great view of the stage to enjoy a concert of the Cleveland Quartet. Um, we got there early. We didn't want to miss the beginning of the concert. Uh, so about 20 minutes before the concert, someone came out from backstage and said, uh, Paul Katz is, has a health problem, and we're not sure exactly if he's going to be able to play the entire concert. We're trying to figure out how to cover this. And so we heard you're here, and, and, and would you play a quartet? <laughs> and we were not dressed for it. We did not have instruments. We had no music. And we certainly did not have our stomachs in the right condition to be playing a concert. So we talked about it for a moment and decided, uh, it's such an honor to be asked to do this, but we're not going to be able to put our best foot forward in this circumstance. So we said, oh, wish we could help, but not this time. Okay, so we settled in. We're still gonna enjoy this concert, whatever it turns out to be. 10 minutes later, it came out again. Um, a new idea, Paul Katz still needs to go get medical attention, but would you, speaking now to me, the cellist, because uh, Paul is the cellist of the mm -hmm. quartet, would you be willing to play the Haydn quartet that have, they have scheduled with the quartet? Um, so again, I'm, I haven't, my stomach has not gotten any less full, but I think I got a little bit more crazy. So I said, I said, okay. Um, it was a Haydn quartet that we had played recently, and I believe that the Cleveland quartet had even coached us. Um, of course, I had never rehearsed it with them or mm -hmm. played it with them or even heard them play it lately. So this was clearly going to be a pretty big adventure. And, you know, sight reading parties amongst musicians are some of the most fun things we could imagine doing. But it's usually not with an audi audience full of people watching. Yeah, there are usually a thousand people in the house watching you. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like I said, something was a little crazy in my mind, I guess. And I thought, well, this will be fun. An adventure. I mean, I idolized the quartet. So something to put in my like little memory book someday, I got to play with the Cleveland Quartet. Um, so we did it. Uh, the quartet looked at me beforehand. I went backstage, warmed up for 10 minutes before the concert and Paul's cello tried to get to know it. Um, they turned to me and said, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> and some jokes were made on stage. I think they 
promise the audience that I knew how to read music because I certainly didn't look like I was ready to play a concert. Um, and we pl and we played, and it was it was a roller coaster ride. I remember just thinking it was the most fun thing. I was simultaneously nervous and so having so much fun. Um, the one thing that I was really mortified about later, and I might not have agreed if I had known this beforehand, I found out that the New York Times was there to write a review of the concert. And uh, I'm glad I found that out later because uh, that was, you know, uh, anyway, the review turned out to be quite charming and I think understanding of the situation. I'm sure it was not the best Haydn Quartet that was ever played. No, I, it was fantastic though. And I speak here as a listener and I was working as an usher for this concert. So in fact, I handed you your program uh, and I might have been the one to give them the tip backstage that, uh, that you were there. But the members of the Cleveland Quartet were also absolutely on the edge of their chairs for this. The audience was on the edge of our chairs because we knew that anything might happen. And there was just such electricity and excitement in the air. And then when you started playing and it was working, there was this thrilling sense of goodwill that was filling the hall because there were a thousand people who were all silently rooting for every single entrance and every single cutoff. And it was so exciting. It was so riveting. Uh, it really was one of the signal listening experiences of my entire life. And uh, it's still really vivid to me because it impressed on me the value of live performance. Mm. That sense that anything might happen in a live performance. I I totally agree with you, and that's what made it so exciting to me too, being involved in it. But this sense, and these are my favorite concerts, whether it's something unexpected like that or the group you expected to hear and they're rehearsed. I hope that, like for example, when we come to play a Converse, I hope that even though we will have practiced well before the concert, that we feel in the quartet and that that feeling comes out to the audience, that still, even though you've rehearsed, Anything could happen. We don't know the outcome of the next note, the next movement, the next phrase. Um, it's all being created or at least recreated on the spot. And um, it's truly different every night. I, I, our quartet rehearses differently now than we used to because of this. And um, I think when we were younger, we tried very much to try and control every moment and understand what was going to happen every time. Now it's more like, we want to understand how to listen to each other at every moment so that we can in the moment sort of uh, experience what someone else is experiencing. Um, and that goes for the audience too. I mean, on stage, you can feel how the audience is listening to you. Or if you're in the audience, I think this is what you're talking about, why live music is so important and listening together. You can feel the way everyone around you is listening too. It's not just you listening. It's like the way the whole room is listening. And when there's that sense of like immediacy and um, and a good kind of uncertainty, like anticipation, mm -hmm. that there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Listening to a CD at home is not the same, or or, or listening to an online concert because maybe it's live, but you're not with other people when you're listening. So um, I'm so glad that the pandemic seems to be winding down because I've truly missed that part of um, making music. Yeah, and chamber music is, out of all the genres, the one that lends itself so well to this because there's such a small number of people on stage. If mm. somebody wants to take a little bit of a left turn in the middle of a phrase and do something different, they can do so, and the rest of the group then has to go with them. If the cellist in you know, the New York Philharmonic decides he wants to play a phrase a little bit differently, well, he's kind of outvoted. <laughs> uh, you know, their, their experience is a little bit more dictated from the podium, whereas in a, in a chamber setting, every individual at every moment can make a decision that will change the outcome. True. True. So tell us a little bit about this program, which I'm also deeply, deeply excited about this particular program and about its relevance to Spartanburg. Um, well, so um, the program is based on a couple of, a couple of ideas that have long been interesting to us. Um, one is the idea of American music, because I think in many ways, because the roots of classical music and the string quartet are in Western Europe, sometimes we don't feel like we own this. In fact, now, even these, these days, it's such a big part of conversation around classical music is, you know, does it truly reflect the diversity of our world now? Um, and I happen to think it does, because that's the story of classical music, because it has grown increasingly diverse with every generation of music that's been created. 
Um, and as music, as this tradition of music came to America, it certainly, it certainly took hold here and people latched onto it and expressed their own feelings and worlds it, within that tradition. Um, and so this program is very much meant to sort of uh, be an example of that, of the, of the way string quartet writing has sort of flowered in American hands. Um, the other side interest of ours was well, a main interest of ours, but it's sort of a side part of this program. Um, we become very enamored uh, um, again, I should say, of the music of Dvorak. Um, he first became very important to us because straight out of school, back in the days when that story happened at Norfolk, we, our, our first job out of school um, was to live in a farm town in Iowa on a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, specifically aimed at placing sort of serious chain music groups in underserved and rural areas. Um, and which is part of the reason why we were so eager to hear the Cleveland Quartet, because we had been uh, sort of on our own in this uh, in this town in Iowa. And so we we're sort of starved to hear other musicians play and stuff like that. Um, anyhow, but as it turns out, 100 years or actually to be precise, 99 years before we went to Iowa, Dvorak went to Iowa, to Spillville, Iowa, because he was homesick. He had been working in New York, brought from Bohemia to New York to work. Homesick in New York for Bohemian, thing, Bohemian things and heard that there was a settlement out in Iowa. So during the summertime, he came out to Spillville, Iowa, which was about 70 miles from the town we lived in. Um, so and he while there, he wrote um, his beloved American String Quartet, one of the best known and uh, most popular quartets in the re repertoire, not just amongst Dvorak's output, all of it. And so while we were in Iowa, of course, it made perfect sense to play this quartet. And we played it, I wouldn't say hundreds of times, mm. um, and grew to appreciate not just the piece, but what it meant for Dvorak to be a musician in this environment, in that environment in Iowa, and his desire to make music in a community and to spread it and let it be a, a living part of a way that people contribute to community life just the same as if they were farmers or firemen or lawyers or school teachers. Um, and because that's what we were doing in Iowa. So he became very much a touchstone for us. And recently we've returned to it because I hope this is not too much of a diversion. You can edit this out if it's too much. <laughs> but the whole reason he came to New York was to head a music school, one of the main music schools in New York at the time, uh, bankrolled by a, a wealthy American woman named Jeanette Thurber. Mm -hmm. and. One of the things he and Miss, Miss, Mrs. Thurber did uh, right off the bat in the school, Dvorak was brought here to help American composers learn to write American music. So right. again, the sort of the mission that we're trying to exemplify in this in this program that we're playing, um, he saw as important source material like the African American spiritual, uh, Native American music. He was on all that, and and in addition, I read recently that at this music school something like 30, 40 percent of it was uh, minorities and women. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine in the 1890s having a music school that was aiming to be what today's colleges and music schools are trying to be. Um, so we're involved in a, in, in, in a much bigger segment of history, even though it's very current, this part of the discussion. Anyhow, so we've returned once again to Dvorak as a real touchstone for um, the 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 ambitions of our age too um so because he's a part of this sort of western european tradition that has flowered in america and so many other places too and in so many ways anyhow so we're playing the divorce american on this program <laughs> and, as you know, well and, as when, when he was here the, you know he even wrote a magazine article for i think harper's uh saying hey american composers stop trying to copy us europeans instead look at your great source material and write music that reflects the diversity uh, and the musical energy of your own country Dvorak that, was so doing then what we're trying to do now mm -hmm. i think and that's what this program is is kind of doing isn't it that's so, right. so you're beginning with barber right tell us right. talk for a minute just about that barber piece so so uh not everyone knows the Barber String Quartet. It's written when he was a fairly young man. Um, but almost everyone knows the second movement of the Barber mm -hmm. Quartet because it is also known as the Barber Adagio and often played by massed strings in an orchestra setting. Um, and in fact, that that movement is one of the most iconic pieces of American classical music, I would say, 
um, found its way into movies and played on all sorts of occasions of national seriousness or mourning sometimes. Um, it's simple and profound uh, in, in, well, that's, that's what I will say. It's simple and profound. Um, so we enjoy playing it because, of course, as a string quartet, it's the original setting of the quartet. And you hear these outer movements, which sort of like the like like having a nice wedding ring is that sort of set as the setting for this gem of a movement that's right in the middle. Um, and uh, I think the difference hearing it in a string quartet setting versus mass strings is you can hear the personal quality of the music more easily. and for me, you can hear the vulnerability and the fragile quality of the music, which some, which is a quality that I love about music in general, that it exists only in a moment, like, like, like only in a moment, and and that moment will never be recreated. There's something very fragile about music as an art form. Like, I'm not counting CDs and that kind of stuff, because that's not like, for me, that's not the real experience of music. It's like what we were talking about, what you were saying about live music. Mm -hmm. It's this moment that won't be recreated. And you can feel the fragility and the and the energy of the Barbara Daggio even more in a quartet setting than you can with massed strings. Um, so so we love we love playing it this way. And it's a piece I expect that is you know as a listener you're not thinking boy this is difficult you're thinking this is incredibly powerful you know that's the a quartet performance of this piece was what made me want to be a professional musician when I was twelve I was going to be a baseball player up until that point. Uh, but I imagine it's actually quite difficult because you've got to sustain these very long lines, which means keeping the bow pressure really, really even and making sure your, your bow pressure is exactly as even as the violist, as the two fiddle players. That really must require quite a lot of energy and concentration, right? Yeah, no one's supposed to know that, though, Chris. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, <laughs> okay, no Moving on. <laughs> uh, we can't. We can't. So we can't quite do as slow a tempo as Leonard Bernstein does with the strings of the New York Philharmonic. Yeah. But but you, like I said, you more than make up for it by you can hear the like the effort of the bow moving that slowly and 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 connecting to the next note in this very controlled, delicate yet strong and unbreakable way, and um it's it's a it's a beautiful piece of music he 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 in fact he knew when he um wrote this piece that it was kind of special because he was in his 20s and he wrote a letter to who did he write anyhow it's not important who he wrote to but in this letter he said i've just finished the second one with the quartet and it's a doozy <laughs> <laughs> we'll write that word down i like that so <laughs> you're also doing a really, really beautiful piece by Jennifer Higdon, a living composer, uh, called Southern Harmony, right? Yes, it's a piece that we commissioned from Jennifer, actually, uh -huh. and we are returning to it. We, we, she wrote it in the uh, mid-2000, 2000 knots, is that how you say it? Anyhow, uh, it's, it's, been a few, it's been a few years now since it was written, but we, we're returning it because it makes such sense on this program. Um, in fact, we've had a long-standing commissioning pr uh, program, you could call, where we've um, asked composers to write music that somehow reflects on being an American. That's all. That's all we we say. We don't. We're try trying to put like a constraints on the composer, but we thought this idea could tie things together as well as, like I said, create some sort of distinctively American string quartet music. So this was her thought because she's a Southerner. So she wrote this piece called Southern Harmony. Um, the title comes from you told me uh, 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 a a yeah. hymn, hymn book, right? From yeah, from the Shape Note Hymn Book, Southern Harmony and Musical Companion, published right here in Spartanburg, folks, by Singing Billy Walker in 1835. That is that is awesome. So Jennifer's piece is not specifically about hymns, but right. um, but more about Southern music and Southern life in mm -hmm. uh, in general. So there's there's three movements to this piece, and the first one I think is called Soft Summers, and it's supposed to capture the vibe of sitting on the porch and the sort of like easy, little slower uh, pace of life, more thoughtful, more reflective. Um, there's also a lot, a lot of the sound of um, sort of Appalachian string playing, open, stri open strings and little slides and, and scoops. Um, the second movement for sure is about uh, fiddle, Appalachian fiddle playing. It's called real time, so uh, R-E-E-L, mm -hmm. so after, uh, after the dance form. So that and that for sure is some good, good, uh, good old fashioned fiddling. And then the last one is I think called Gentle Waltz, and that's after the Tennessee Waltz. And and Jennifer herself grew up in in I believe in Tennessee and also in Georgia. 
-hmm. And so this is also a piece which is reflective of her childhood. Yeah, and it is a beautiful, beautiful piece. And you're doing a piece that I don't know all that well, is right? By, uh, by, by Billy Childs, correct? Yeah, Billy's another composer uh, friend of ours who we've uh, had a lot of connection with, especially over the maybe last 15 years or so. Um, we we met him because he and Phil, my brother Phil, served on a board together. And I think during board meetings, I'm sure they're probably, maybe they were bored, literally bored. Um, they were like, let's make some music, <laughs> you know, because that's one of the hard things about administrating or being in that side of music is and some on some level, then you're thinking, I need to make some music now. Mm -hmm. um, so Billy is a wonderful jazz pianist. Uh, and, and composer. But the interesting thing about him from our point, point of view is that he is just as intrigued by um, Bartok quartets and, and the Ravel string quartet and Janacek as he is with jazz. And um, so he's written music that tries to sort of take advantage of both worlds. And some of the most interesting concerts we've done with him are with him and his band. His band is already unconventional. Um, he uses, you know, like a, a reeds player, a wind player, as well as harp, guitar, drums too, and bass. Um, he's a pianist. Uh, and then and then for an extra bonus, he'll throw in a string quartet. And so we've done some fascinating concerts with him where I never really feel quite comfortable, but I don't think his band feels so comfortable either because we're all kind of like making music together in this in this way that none of us usually makes music. Um, all, all sort of channeled through Billy's ears. The piece that we're going to play on this concert is a short one movement piece that actually has maybe only been played for an audience once before, he told me. So he is excited that we were willing to play it. Um, and he just describes it as Bebop meets Bartok. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds very exciting indeed. And I really do feel as though this program was made for us here in Spartanburg. Uh, and practically even made for me personally. So I'm so excited. I'll be so glad to welcome you, uh, y'all, when you're here next week. Uh, and we are greatly looking forward to it. We'll, I'm sure, enjoy that concert a lot. Folks will enjoy uh, getting to shake your hand amidst the shrimp and the other goodies at the reception afterwards. So thank you for taking the time today to speak with us. Uh, and we are very, very, very much looking forward to this concert. Hey, it's my pleasure, Chris. And we'll see you on Monday. Yeah, thanks.